Here we go. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the next episode of the Cathode Ray Podcast. Uh, my name is Louis Zezer. I'm very happy to have you here. And I'm joined by my friend and colleague, because that's what you say, friend and colleague, Steve Nutter. How you doing, mate? I'm doing well. Thank you very much for the wonderful in- introduction there, colleague. What can, uh, <laughs> what's going on with you today? That's, by the way, that's an old reference to DF, uh, to Digital Foundry, actually. Yeah. Uh, we'll yeah. get that one. I, uh, actually, the bit that I wanted to tell you about was uh, I wanted to uh, talk about the way I pronounce your last name. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Because yeah. you've, I mean, let's let's be straight up, Nutter. You must have got shit over the years for Nutter. <laughs> oh my god! You can't imagine. You can you can imagine <laughs> actually. Yeah, yeah. That was always man. That was always. I mean, and it's funny. You're bringing this up from a European perspective because, um, I mean, I got so yeah. I would get all kinds of stuff for the last name Nutter, right? As, as a kid growing up and. You just, you know, it makes you, it, of course, it's like a rites of passage makes you kind of tougher. Uh, yeah, okay. But I didn't understand that it meant like goofball or like loony person till I went to college. And I'm and two of my best friends that I met the first year in the dorms were uh, both from they were on the swim team scholarship from England, like London. And yeah. they were like, what? What's your last name? Nutter. <laughs> nutter and so they were they loved me they we would pull the weirdest pranks on each other <laughs> but yeah they they were like you know nutter means in this and then so i was like no i had no idea like w- there was an actual reference for nutter uh oh like a, yeah else. like he's a bit of a nutter like, like, you know, he's a bit crazy. yeah he's a nutter he's a bit, yeah, he's not all like, there there's a few right. sheep in the top paddock that are not there yeah we say so i used to um i used to get of course there's a nutter butter cookie so people are like, oh, like the Nutter Butter cookie? And I'd be like, yeah, man, my family's billionaires because you guys eat those cookies. And they're like, really? And I'm like, no, unfortunately not. I just have the name. I don't get, I didn't get to be born into the cookie, cookie fortune. <laughs> so I thought when I, 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 we started this podcast, I sort of instinctively, I thought like, I mean, I was, when I grew up, look, I was a fat kid. My name's Lewis. So you could get, look, you can easily, I grew up in the brutal public school system of rural australia in the 90s brutal so uh you know i had puis maybe instead of lewis uh <laughs> you know i understand wanting to do that but however when i came to introduce your name i instinctively i pronounce it with the estonian pronunciation which would be <laughs> nutter or n-o-o if you want to say in english style n-o-o-t nutter is what if you if the Estonian person read that word? That's so, hilarious because that's so even worse. Like where I live, that's an even worse like reference than just nutter because neuter it means oh, to neuter. remove your balls. <laughs> like like oh, Brutus. Oh, it's not has even been, neuter. Not, Bruce, I would say Brutus not, not, has been neutered. Right, so he doesn't have his he doesn't have his testosterone makers anymore. Neuter. So that's. <laughs> Oh, you're right, nutter. Yeah, neutered. You can't. Kind of, it's so stupid it's got, it's English speakers. To that we, sounding. Oh, dude, my girlfriend. She says words, and I'm just like, I cannot hear the difference between those two vowels. She's like, what? They're two completely separate words that have really independent <laughs> meanings. And I'm like, you just said the same word to me twice. We just don't have a lot of that capacity to sound out vowels, and uh, used to like, especially in Australia, we. We have like three vowels, ah, ah, and uh, that's it. That's, <laughs> you don't use many vowels in Australian English. Hey, mate, fuck this, man. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, yeah, that's, well, I was going to add, I didn't, I really didn't know, um, because like, I, it's not something that I really like say a lot as my net last name or anything. I don't think I've ever probably said my last name on my channel. I don't care. It's, mm-hmm. it's literally funny. There's a lot of, it's not a, it's not even that rare of a name in the United States. Like there's I, I've moved to every time I moved to town, it was like, oh, yeah, you're a nutter. Are you related to these nutters? And it's like, what? There's other nutters here. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. And you're like, then people are like, I don't believe you. There, there can't be this many nutters in the world. And uh, it was like, yeah, it can. so like I moved to Oregon. There was a big construction company out there called Nutter Construction. So I was like, what? And then when I moved to the place I moved in Tennessee from here originally as a kid, there was another Nutter family not related to me in the same town. And like I went to school 
and there was a girl that was in the same grade as me and her last name was Nutter. So everybody thought we were related. And then the same thing, like she had younger siblings that were all the same age as my younger siblings and they all wound up in the same classes in the same town. So it was, it was really an odd thing to run into so much of it. But, um, yeah, when I got out into the career world into the concrete world which like we had talked about all these that was always funny like you go get this hyper specialized technical degree and then you get thrown out into a world where everybody who you're working around at best has a high school diploma and i'm not saying this in any way as like a negative thing but there's definitely a, a culture difference between blue collar workers everybody knows it in construction and like a white collar office job completely definitely. different so mm -hmm. You know, you got nut job, nut case. Hey, there's yeah. nut job. And I was like, oh, great. Yeah. Nut case, You've come over here. You've heard it all before. You've heard everything a trillion yeah. times, right? Hey, did you nut yet? Nut case That's or what something? I thought. You know, I thought like, by saying, like, yeah, like, nut, nut, I didn't want to comment. Nut, I'm nut, like, nut, this nut. dude's heard everything. <laughs> but no, so it's not right. It's not like anything that, uh, yeah, like I've heard, I can't, I, I can't think of a reference that now besides the cookies that I've heard, I mean, everything. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't, uh, I mean, like I said, it's like, it, it, there's this old Johnny Cash, Johnny Cash song called A Boy Named Sue, mm -hmm. and uh, it's an awesome song, but it's the whole thing is about how this, this guy, na he's, he names his kid Sue, right, his son, and his son, the whole song is about how his son takes beatings his whole life for being named Sue, right, and so finally... His dad and him become estranged. And he, by the end of this song, they both meet each other in a bar and they get into a fist fight that falls out into the street. And he's like, why the hell did you name me Sue? And he's like, because I knew it would make you tough and I wasn't going to be there for you. But I made named you Sue so you could get your ass kicked and be all right. And uh, that's like the moral of the story. They hug at the end and love each other because they get it. He gets it why he was named Sue. <laughs> Well, the surnames we can't help, you know. We can't. Yeah, right. So you can't no do anything about one. the nutter, but but anyway, yeah, that's uh, that's some fun fun stuff. Ah, oh, cool, man. So yeah, anyway, that's because sometimes I and I think also sometimes I've started this podcast and I go and I talk to my friend Steve and, yeah, and I'm like, don't say it, <laughs> don't fucking <laughs> say it, don't point it out, don't be a dick. Well, <laughs> see, and the weird thing about I have to tell you the funny thing is is like with YouTube, if you say like a dirty word in like in the first thirty seconds or something or one minute, then it gets your like uh video put into the yellow category where it's edgy or something. I don't know. Ooh. Anyway. So if you I wonder if nutters on the list where they'll just be like Is that a bad word? So you might yeah, we might have to change it up to not get flagged for saying oh nutter in the first 30 seconds <laughs> let's hope i mean i drop enough f-bombs as it is so okay oh I yeah we'll see stop the f-bombs until a bit later i've been trying to no, in recent yeah, episodes yeah i later. was gonna say is if i think if you make it past a minute it doesn't matter like they don't <laughs> care okay so here's another thing though with the nutter deal i would go on and try to like make profiles and like in enter my name into things you mm -hmm. know on websites and it would say we don't allow profanity on this website. And it was like, dude, that's my real last name. I'm not like trying to be nutter. It's like, uh, that would always, that would always piss me off the most was when it it's would be like, bad. Ooh, this like, is a what? dirty word. You can't use yeah. this. And I'm like, this is my name jerk. <laughs> That would be funny if the dude who instigated it was Mr. Jerk at the company. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah oh, well, so he's in name. charge of policy. Mr. Jerk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mr. Jerk. Fuck you. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, let's get back to something real here for a let's second. Do it. So now, last, this... the last episode mm. we did have Martin on, which was awesome. Mm -hmm. Right? That was a lot Martin of fun. Martin was great. Fun to speak with him. And this episode, we wanted to just have another one with Steve and I just talking shit uh talking right. about the projects that we're up, doing this week we're always stuff. yeah we're always uh working on something um like most people i don't know probably like most of you there's always something you're fiddling with always something you're working on uh so we're just gonna kind of go through that stuff in one of these episodes and hopefully you tell a few stories and hopefully you, you know a few of you like listen to just us talk about our week and our stories and our backstories and stuff as well and then you know we got a few interviews coming up as well nice little balance yes yeah. Yeah, it's a good it's a good balance. I think it's a good way for us to kind of take a second to breathe because 
the interviews are awesome and I love doing them. Um, but we don't get to really talk about anything. Uh, well, we do. It's not true. We do get to have fun stories and still do that thing. But we don't get to then just it's like it's there's no point to bring somebody else on and be like, hey, you want to hear about my projects this week? It's right. like, no, we want we bring, we're bringing on special people so that we can kind of like do what Bob does, is, you know, try to highlight what they're doing. Talk and these them, people are more specifically. Know. Yeah, it's, mm-hmm. it's more about them. It's about what they're doing uh, mm-hmm. within our community here. And that's the big thing. So, um it's great to have a break here because we got another interview at least planned for the next one so uh it's always good to you know take a take a minute to breathe and and also talk about our 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 going ons so i wanted to to start with we i i think a lot of we've both been working a lot of ps2 stuff for the last few weeks so before we sort of go deep down that rabbit hole um just some thoughts based off uh youtube comments that i've got from the last video that I did about the OLED PVM. I'm thankful that so many people are interested in that and want to hear about it. I know I was saying, oh, I don't think it's very good and it's a really you know, easy one, but it turns out people were happy to listen for eight minutes and hear about that. But the very common sentiment in the comments was, hey, that's great. This is a lovely screen, but how does it stack up to a modern OLED? And when you put the two price points, you got the LG OLED beautiful and big for 800 or is this one 3000 what you know how do they compare and i wanted to um just address that quickly because for me i i don't know anything i have never owned an oled i don't know i don't have a modern screen uh we have a 4k lcd samsung but it's really like your entry level samsung it's nothing works fine nothing special and then people ask well what's what's the use of this monitor then you know why should i save up for this rather than buying the LG model or something. And it's not. I, the way I, I came to describe it was when I see something like that OLED PVM, I have a sense of transposed nostalgia. I have a nostalgia for something that's actually more modern because it looks, I guess maybe it's like if, um, I don't know, you're into an old muscle car, Camaro, Camaro, if I'm saying that right or something, and then, or the Mustang. And then there's the latest model Mustang and it kind of looks it, it's all new, new tech, but you still have some transposed nostalgia. And that's how I feel when I see that PVM. And I also, also too, I have a sense of um, expectation of future possibilities because who knows, maybe that monitor will drop a little bit and then maybe in a few years we will be picking that up retro for some reason. Maybe we're ahead of the curve on flat screen pvms and so there's also some idea like oh maybe this is something it's still maybe it's on its way down maybe i'll see this so i'm excited for its possibility and just because it represents something that we love what do you think about that steve well first off i thought it was an awesome video too because i mean let's be honest you were talking with me on behind the scenes you know off recording and you're like oh this thing it's like it's like a a, a a yoke hanging off my neck, you know, I'm dragging it around this OLED review. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, man, the way you were putting it, I was like, I was like, don't do that. I'm kind of pumped to see it. I still want to see what you got going here. And then I watched it. And I was like, man, this is awesome. I love I love the way you had it together and the way you produced it. It was really, really good. And then I love the fact that it got, you know, a lot of traction. It was mm-hmm. awesome. And here's the idea. This, this, is, this is like... Uh, I don't think I, I, I get this is one of the frustrating things I can understand about a lot of like the stuff we're reviewing, because, again, there's no reviews on it. And like, what perspective are you really thinking? Like, are we really renting? Let's let's be serious here for a minute. Are we really renting a piece of pro equipment um, just to compare it with the modern OLED screen? It's kind of a it, it, it's kind of a silly thing to do at this point, unless that's the specific thing you're looking at. Uh, this, uh, this kind of display technology has not really been covered at all for like gaming purposes as far as like the professional stuff and broadcast quality. So, um, I feel like, I feel like you're doing yourself a disservice more than like, I mean, if as, as a viewer, if you're thinking I should consider buying this PVM over the brand new OLED, because let's just, you know, let's just cut that right there kind of right now, because 
the uh, the the monitor you reviewed was still over ten years old, right? Yep. So two thousand eleven. Right. That I mean that we're talking like the LCD. I mean we're thankful, right? The LCD review I did on the BVM or PVM, um, it was it was blatant that this is not usable for any retro gaming purposes. I mean mm. it was that bad. So if the same thing would have happened with the OLED. We wouldn't even be talking about this right now, right? If it would have had the same lag problem over HDMI. Um, so, like, with my LCD review, it's like, it's that thing. It's like, there's no there's no reason to um, argue that point. It's just like, we're reviewing what the next step was in, in technology. And that's the mm. same thing as with this OLED. It's like a first introduction to the next step of this technology. And uh, so seeing that it actually there is a potential there is awesome because then, like you say, if it comes to a point where these displays, uh, you can find one that needs some kind of repair and all it ends up being is a power supply burnout like the LCD one. Mm. OK, then, yeah, it's something to look at. But if you're thinking, should I go spend more money for a smaller 10 year old used piece of broadcast equipment compared to the new thing in store that is a little bit bigger, brand new? Um, then it, I, I don't think that's a great, you know, comparison. Mm. Like that's not, I mean, I, I don't think you should. Yeah. I, I it, 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 that seems like a pretty much almost no brainer to me. And I, I don't know. Is that, is that kind of like, do you, does that, is that the right answer? Like, am I going down the right path here? I think so. But I think also about? when you see, although I get where you're coming from and I do agree with it. But also, surely, you've watched some video sometime, and there's some cool shit, and you're like, oh, fuck, no, I want that. <laughs> God damn it. Well, of course, so... yes. Right, then you see it, I and mean, I can see There's it's, all kinds of stuff. It's plugging people's OCD, and we all have a little yeah. bit of that in the, in, the, in the hobby. That's what we do. Like, I need, I need all of my ROM sets arranged properly on the file system, <laughs> and I need all of the things laid out, and it's, I'm going to spit you know, and, and I need to have like, one. Oh. I need to have one OLED representation of a PVM in my collection till I get this. You know, I, I, I'm a lot like you too, though. I've not got, um, I've not gotten an OLED display myself either at all. I have the screen you're looking behind me is from 2007. That one, and it's a plasma. And then um, this week, I bought a couple LC or I bought an LCD uh, monitor that is for the basically a computer gaming monitor where that's just no that the thing is like there no latency so like right now um to me latency is always the biggest thing to look at just about with these displays and then the uh stuff is secondary but i know exactly what you mean where you see something yeah. and you want it and i mean like if i if i saw a good deal on one of course i'd buy one because, oh. I mean, look what I did. I, I just worked on a LCD that's basically worthless. I don't know what to do with the thing anymore. Hang it on my wall and, and like, display images on it. I, like, I was laughing. I was thinking, what am I going to do with this thing? And uh, so you, if you go into, like, a, a, a pub and then you go into the restroom and then there's, like, the advertisements, like, right above oh, the yeah, pisser. Oh, yeah, in front of your face, right? yeah. Yeah. I was like, I might just put that in my bathroom down here and just have, like random pictures on it if you ever yeah. turn it on like you know i'm like what? <laughs> just just do something funny like hang it right there above the toilet so somebody's like what you know I, what yeah. else are you gonna do with it it's like so um i understand the fascination but sometimes mm -hmm. uh see i i get i get to where i really get humped up pumped up on something and then i get like this phase where i'm like oh you're crazy you're crazy you know why are you getting so pumped about this and then I, if i get re-pumped about it then i know it's something that yeah i should buy and so, um, I don't know. I know somebody, I'm sure somebody that watched that was though, like you say, I mean, if enough people watched it, they were considering, do I need to buy this or, or hunt for one? And you can't. better than hey, what I can is, get. Yeah. This is a I mean, good, it's, it's also, a good thing. Um, times that you can need, So it's been 11 years since that was released. And then I also reflect on, well, what's it like? How were our... A series, D series, BVMs. Eleven years after release, I think they were still. Well, that. Oh would have been... yeah, you're a good point. Mm. They're they're really really good. Like, I mean, mm. we're we're at the point now where they're from 2006, so they're 16 mm. years old now, and the majority of them hit are the bottom. Have lower they've hours. already hit the the price bottom though, and they're on the way yeah. up. So 
Yeah. I'm not so I, but I don't know where the OLED stuff does because since OLED's something that there's a lot of modern stuff, I would be willing to bet there will become a time when these OLEDs should be bought. But what I'm thinking it is, is it's whenever they like Sony comes out and says, you need the QLED. I don't know what it is. Right. Mm-hmm. And they say, here's the QLED display. And then all these people who have these old OLED displays are like, oh, let's get rid of them. Right. And then that's when we come in and scoop them up. And uh, so I do. I mean, you know, if you're if you're like worried um, that there will be a shortage of OLED screens, I don't know that that's really going to happen kind of the way that the CRT is, you know, because they I, I suspect basically stop well, production. I was trying to draw the comparison. I said 11 years, 11 years. That monitor is 11 years old. How are our BVMs when? the CRTs, but I I suspect though that the timeline will be different for these OLEDs because we had a very, it felt like a very quick end of CRT. Sony was out and we got a, and we've got a whole new thing that's completely different and completely better. Or so they say eventually OLED was, you know, and I, I kind of, when I look at OLED, I wonder like, how the hell can you get better than this? How the hell can you make a screen? I mean, you can get better. But how can you get a like, oh, wow, holy crap, that is so much better than OLED. OLED looks like a heap of junk now. I don't know that's going to happen soon. Unless it's some kind of almost, unless there's a screen that comes out that makes 240p like pop out at your eyes, almost in a three-dimensional like viewing experience where, you know, like one of the things I really think that is creative that's been popular for a while are those little art things you'll see on like Etsy or some uh, website where somebody makes a shadow box of something from like the Nintendo era where they, you know, 3D impose something a little bit further out and they put it in a nice box and it looks real cool, like a wall hanging deal. So I don't know if there's some kind of futuristic display that will eventually make it to where it's like almost like a 3D style look that might be cool. And like, that would probably be shocking. But yeah, how much, <clears throat> how much better can the retro games really look? It's like at this, at this point, it's, mm. so I, don't, I, I think, think at that may... point, it's going to be like the next generation up, right? The HDMI native consoles, how awesome are they going to look the best on the OLEDs? Right compared to yeah. other stuff um the good thing about the oleds is they did have all the lcd era to work out all the crappy mm. crappiness <laughs> so which is why it's not they're, just OLED is good. which they is why screen and... oleds are good and the lcds are the ones that you definitely can leave behind probably uh, let's do let's do because there's ps2 and there's a lot of different stuff let's talk about um so with the uh with the release of the retro nas uh, which we could talk a lot more about. It's a network share that if you have all your different consoles uh, with the homebrews, that there's a lot of different ways to have all of your files in one place and just connect remotely. And the system that is already doing that or was already doing that was PS2. It was already the best way to load your PS2 files was using OPL via Ethernet. I do want to jump in. Yes, if you've got a fat, use a hard disk. True, agreed. But if definitely if you've got a slim with the built-in um, Ethernet port, then it's pretty much as fast. And I know I've had one of those set up. It's pretty tricky. And But you are try or have set one of these up, but you had no physical wires or anything. You've had to go straight down the yeah. rabbit hole on this, haven't you? Yeah, so, um, you know, this is one of the things we were probably going to talk more about in our next interview, but the, Mm -hmm. or like the, uh, like the, uh, the Retro NAS deep dive stuff, but yeah, I found out about the Retro NAS project from Bob first, and then Dan Mons, who's been working on it, um, he, uh, Bob put out the videos and I was like, you know, I've wanted something like this. And I was, I was like, if I could find anything in my house to set up, to work on this, I will. And so I was digging into some of these things that I have stored in this closet back here. They're like kids items. And I find this retro or this raspberry Pi three that, um, is in this kit called a Kano computer kit. And it's like this kit that is designs it's designed for a kid to build a computer and then it comes with a little keyboard and it's a Pi three and they go through some coding basics with this Pi three in a box as like a selling thing. And I was like, I mean, it's just been, I threw my kid liked it for like a week 
a long time ago, you know, and then lost interest. So I threw it all back in the box and I was like, oh my goodness, I can actually use this thing for something. And so I hooked that up with the Toshiba hard drive that I had. It followed all Bob's directions on his instructional tutorial and it worked like, I mean, 99% of the way I got it without really having to do anything else besides just following it step by step and then download and follow the GitHub page. So I set that up originally and then I wound up moving that to the other side of the room. You see the the biggest challenge and this has always been the biggest thing. I put the Mr. Cade down here way back in this corner. Yeah, we could see it right in the middle there, yeah. Yeah, and so the big challenge was that anytime I wanted to update it, I'd have to take it out of the machine and bring it over here, hook it up to the internet and then um I know I could have done all this wirelessly, but I'm so sick and tired of dealing with the wireless stuff even down here. Mm -hmm in my basement, having everything on wireless, something then doesn't want to work fast or something. So anyway, I was like, I need to get that on a hard wire. So yeah, I mean, 60, wait, yeah, 70 feet of single cat six to get all the way back there <laughs> from the router. Um, so that was the initial before, one. Did you, you just, had no, like well, I had a router or like mm -hmm. an ether, like my e internet service gives me something that it actually yeah. is a router d device. So mm -hmm. I had to, like, we had been talking. I was like, oh, I got a Netgear switch that has eight ports in it. So that's back there by my television now. Uh, and I put that in between the run to the machine back there so that I could have internet come there to the television. And then I could get everything. So I, I moved the retro NOS back there behind the television. And so it's hooked up in over there. And then I've got, obviously, the Mr. Kate hooked up ethernet into the port and then i started plugging in all the consoles that i've got over there like a ps2 slim like we're talking about mm. so the idea is to um take my backup roms and put them on the retro nos and then like you say remotely use this ethernet cat 6 system to pull the roms because there's nothing like you said no storage device really much at all unless you want to add an additional external I don't know, SS, uh, uh, SD stick or something, I'm not sure, a USB for the uh, for the PlayStation 2 Slim. So, yeah, I've got it hooked up. I've not run, I've just been run, like uh, compiling the ROMs into the retro NOS and then finally bought a free McBoot memory card off okay. eBay. So I'm getting that set up and uh, hopefully have this big game again. This <laughs> thing for my 10 year old son and his buddies where they can come by and see like the coolest retro gaming basement in the United States, maybe. <laughs> that's going to be dope. Yeah. I mean, that's cool. So, so you, um, yeah. you had to buy, so you didn't have any uh, Ethernet cables, cable, not much uh -uh. anyway before. And because you were telling me for a while that you were going to make them and then you, the tools were too expensive oh. from what you saw. Yeah. Like it's, it's so funny the Amazon of things, and if you're if you're global, I'm sure it's even better with AliExpress um, because you can get that stuff shipped to you in a decent amount of time. But here, I went to the hardware store, and it's like, here's you need this tool. It's forty five dollars to crimp the wires, and the then crimper, yeah, and then um, I would look over, and it would be Cat Six connectors, and it's like. Here's a 25 pack. And that was the first thing that made me laugh was for $20, it was a 25 pack. And I was like, okay, so this way I can make 12 and a half cables because <laughs> it's not yeah. even an even number. I was like, so you give me 25. That's such a weird number to put in a pack like that. It's definitely but, hardware uh, store prices. So yeah. So then you're, you're sitting there and it's already $65 for just the crimper and the ends. And uh, that's not including the hundred feet of cable you pay another seventy dollars for so i went and priced it at, at just amazon and you can buy you know you can't compete with that cabling price on amazon really it was literally cheaper way cheaper than making my own to just find a, a dealer that would sell a whatever length you need cat six on on uh amazon and deal with that because the the idea of making cables was cool but it's not cost it's not economical uh, unless you could get like wholesale pricing. I don't. I don't mm. see it. Yeah, I was enjoying talking to you about that, uh, and, and because my thing, I, I haven't made a cable in well, actually, now it's more like twenty years. But uh, I did make a lot of cables twenty years ago, 
uh, when I lived when I was at university, I lived with a friend of mine. His name is Jay. I'm hoping to see him again real soon. And he was was and I believe still is involved with professional network installation. He had a van and he would go out literally to work sites and construction sites, and he'd be there on site uh, plugging cables in, and and you'd be putting the the what do you say the the face plate on the wall that has right. the, the connection in and then you would route the cables through the wall that typically all comes back to one uh where you, central place that where your router might be so you've got the patch panel where they all come out and then like an old phone exchange you've got to plug each one into your router so living with jay had these advantages first of all he had all the tools how much how much cable you want we got boxes i got boxes of this stuff coming through no problems he's got all the crimpers all the gear and taught me how to cut them and splice them and then use the crimper tool and we made a lot of uh these cables in our house uh, i remember trying one day one day i went to our patch panel and i patched in two outlets like directly they didn't go through the router and then i tried running the speakers through them so I just sent, I, I made a special, I crimped up my own special cable that took the <laughs> speaker out of the amp and sent it over the, the Cat 6. Sounded very bad. Don't get me wrong. This wasn't good, <laughs> but I wanted to try. I was like, oh, can I send audio all around the house? And no, that's not the correct sure, way to do that. Sure, but it's like, I mean, you know, that, that, the problem is, is like, you know, that, that stuff's so thin that you're going to mm. catch all kinds of uh, interference, interference, I would think, on that. Yeah, because so. if you go and buy, because that was what what we had talked about on uh, my experience with the the actual doing this before was speaker cable and that stuff's you know most of the good speaker cables mm -hmm. pretty darn uh, high on gauge. So I remember what I did was I t I got because a, a an Ethernet has eight, so I got two and I twisted them together so each was at least two. Oh. But again, mm. I was just a dumb. I'm just a dumb you know university kid <laughs> fooling around. It's worth trying back then. You don't know. So one day, on the re yeah. So we had we lived in a uh, we were renting a whole house where I grew up in uh, where I went to university in Newcastle in Australia. You could like three idiots could rent a house in the suburbs and it was still pretty cheap. So and one Jay hated doing network cabling on the weekend because that was his whole job. He didn't necessarily like his job that much, uh, the worksite stuff. But then one I don't know. I guess it annoyed him enough. And one weekend he was like, "We're cabling the house." this weekend oh, no. <laughs> all right so yeah we did room by room we into the plasterboard t -t 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 -t, cut out each face panel he knows the tricks for getting the cable through the wall i don't know how you make all that happen and sort of in a weekend mo mostly him uh we we had our house house networked and i remember we we left when we moved out we just left it because this is literally thousands of dollars worth of work and well, what back then was it was extremely expensive too. Rare and expensive. And we found out later on that the, the real estate agents didn't complain, but they had just come along and taken off the face plates and put blank ones on the wall and just completely <laughs> We're like, you just did thousands of dollars worth of work for you. <laughs> like we just put in an Ethernet system into your house and you just panel cut it and paneled it. Good. Cool. But what we in that house in particular, and Jay is one of my oldest friends from school. And this is so I'll tell this little story here. Um, my friend uh, Jay is gay, and when we were living with him, though, he wasn't. Uh, you know, wasn't out. Pardon me. He had not okay. been public with that information mm -hmm. yet. And, and I, I've known him for a really long time through school, but he hadn't come out with that information yet. But the mm -hmm. thing was when living with my friend, he was always super paranoid about his computer security. This dude, computer always locked, uh, never knew the password, wouldn't let us into his computer and all that. And we were just genuinely mystified. My friend Dita, when we lived, we were like, why is he, why is he always so paranoid about his computer? And <laughs> after we got the network in, we had the printer in a closet because we just thought that was funny to put the printer in a closet. And there was a, a server in there as well that was doing some sort of file sharing. And there was an issue. Jay wasn't home one time. There was an issue we couldn't with the network connection or something. So somehow we ended up getting into the logs. We could get into the logs of the router. And we're trying to work out why doesn't the internet work. And anyway, we're going through the logs. And as you go through the logs, it's like 
XXX, XXXX, you know, this stuff, that stuff, all these titles of these pages of what one might expect, you know, a young man is looking up if he's into that. Yeah, and somebody that's got we the were internet, so I mean. naive. I'm not naive. I don't know how to say like not I don't, naive. Maybe naive is the word that I remember. Dieter and I looked at each other and went, "Oh, it's the pop ups. It must be the pop ups." <laughs> of course, you know you're browsing the internet in the year 2000. There's always a pop up with a weird porn thing. That's yeah, probably what it was. And uh, yeah, it wasn't till uh, it was a couple of years later that he actually came out of the closet. I appreciate he called me up and said, "Oh, I've just told everyone." And uh, <laughs> and then I was like. Oh, oh, it wasn't so the pop-ups. you're like, yeah, that's why you were locking us out of your computer. Uh, <laughs> and I remember no, there was a, a time after that where then we were hanging out at his place. I was sitting in his room and uh, this was some years later. And then because it was like a joke that he's had such high computer security. It was like a running gag for all of us. And I turned yeah. around. And it was like the first time that I can almost ever remember that his computer was sitting there unlocked. And uh, he, sit, he looks at me and he goes, you know what you're going to find, right? And I, was like, <laughs> I was like, all right. <laughs> so I had a look. Well, yeah. It's not my thing, but hey, I had a look. You know, I'll have a look. Yeah. I checked it out. Well, I, worked out- I mean, it's, you know, we've, the society's um, <laughs> thankfully come to a place where there's not the level of just shame and bullying on uh anybody that there was back in that time period you know so you can yeah like i always go back it's the same thing it's people that you um you know friends that you have like you're like come on man you know you're not it it, it's if it's more blatant than that where you're like you know that and you don't care you know you you like but back then in the late 90s early 2000s i mean it was not especially i mean i'm not going to try to beat around it there's a lot of being from the south in the united states there were a lot of people that were not i mean you you would feel bad for them because again you knew that if they did even come out and say something the just level of ignorance from some people especially during that time like you say 90s i mean it was like heavy bullying for any reason much less you you made a comment uh, previously when you were talking about your name and you said yeah. that uh, you, were, you, were, you were saying as well that you originally you had been working on construction sites and, and such things. And I do know, I remember Jay saying to me that it was a, a thing that held him back from come, you know, making his, his status public originally because he had to go and work on construction sites. That was right. his job. Roll up to a construction site, all the blokey blokes doing their thing there. And he knew that was going to be difficult for him. Um, you know, now look, he came out of the closet 20 years ago, so I'm not sort of telling too many uh, stories about him. So I, I'm very interested to catch up with him soon. But uh, yeah, I can't, even with that experience, I can't imagine what that must have been like to go through. But yeah, he, he told us about networking for sure. That is <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it's, it's fun. Like I had, uh, when I was in college, that's, that I remember being in, and that was like the big thing in college was, you would get to go from your crappy home internet yeah. at this time when I was there, it was like dial up and then you get to go. They were like, Oh, you're going to go to school and they're going to have this thing called T one. And so <laughs> that was like half the reason I wanted to live in the campus on a dorm was the fact that they had this high speed internet. You couldn't get anywhere else included at the dorm. And, uh, after that, when we moved out like you with some roommates out to the country near this in Kentucky, where it was is, is where I had, and we, we'd order, it was cable internet and that was still pretty fast, but I can remember never, we never had any networking. So it was like somebody, the cable guy came and installed the modem hmm. in a living room that no, that was like in the center of the house that no one, it, this house had two living rooms. One of them was literally left empty no furniture nothing and there's just a router on the floor or or, or, you know a plugged in (laughs) cable modem and then we put a mount a router in there and it would literally be you'd have to go from your computer grab the plug it in the back and run out with a 60 foot cable from your bedroom and just leave it on the floor and plug it into the router and then like it would get like battle stuff because if if you'd be like oh i need to get faster internet so you'd go over there and like start unplugging your roommate's shit when they're <laughs> looking at like, and they're like what happened like oh man i needed i needed more bandwidth but uh that was like the first experiences and then uh 
with the cable company, we didn't even get to keep the internet that long. And this was because, so when I moved out to this house with these guys, it was a, it was a plan that it was a, five of us, five, right? This is a good idea, right? Five 20 nice. year old, 20 year old men <laughs> going to live in a house and the, the rent, the rent was cheap, man. It was like six fifty. So we were like, holy crap, if we split this five ways, it's like less than 150 bucks a month for us. Mm-hmm. So we did, uh, we did that. And the thing was, is like half of us went and, and moved in the summer before, uh, school started and I wasn't one, I stayed home. And then, uh, I came there later and I was like, so I got there and I was like, what the hell, what's, what's going on with the internet? We had this set up, you know, why is it all messed up? And then, well, we came to find out that, uh, one of the months while we were not there and like some of the other people were there, they let some of our other friends from campus that they were like, Oh, can we, you know, rent nah. from your, your room while no one's living there? And these guys were like, sure. Well, what the guy, one of the guys had done, he was like this, uh, he was this porn addict and he had gone on pay-per-view in the cable box and he had literally ordered a thousand dollars worth of pornography off the internet oh. from like Comcast uh. in a three week period. And so my roommate was like, yeah, man, the cable company, they sent us like thousand dollar bills and we're like fighting them on this stuff. Cause this idiot just sat here watching you know didn't lock him out he just let him run up and i was like man this sucks <laughs> i was excited uh-huh. to come move here and look at this but yeah that was yeah that was the, the thing back then so you couldn't get as easy access to that stuff so it was like oh yeah they got it on pay-per-view it's only 30 I thought bucks you were gonna an say hour that it come and uh used all your download limit or something at least oh no 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 it was worse than that because i remember that as yeah. well the um the, I never lived on campus as such, but uh, in the final, I have a degree of computer science and in the final, wait, the fourth year when I was doing the honors, we call it honors, like a fourth year, I had a right. side business just fixing computers because in the year, I want to say it was 2000, 2001, um, people, that was, we were still deep into Windows 98, Windows ME was still kicking around. Uh, we were still on that. And if we'll all cast our minds back, those operating systems were shit. And your computer was blue screening. Like if your computer blue screened once oh, a day, that was you were common. like, yeah, you were like, oh, well, it blue screened. And I, uh, so my friend wanted their computer fixed. And I said, oh yeah, just bring it around. I'll fix it for you. And then they gave me 50 bucks for it. And I went, you can get, you can get money for this. <laughs> so I had to literally i put an ad in the newspaper i paid for an ad to go in the newspaper and i didn't even have a mobile phone jay my friend he had one and i would take his phone out with me on site in case i had a problem (laughs) very expensive phone call but at least i could call him up and be like yo what do you do about this and i would fix people's computers um just i mean anything back then like oh put a cd-rom drive in or uh and, and some people were literally like they'd see i'd just be like any computer help i'll fix you with it i'll come and help you some people were like can you teach me how to use ms word i'm like yeah all right and and another lady mm-hmm. was in adult education uh learning java as the first year and i was second year or third year by then so i was like oh yeah so i just became she found me in the newspaper and i became her java tutor and i enjoyed some of these a couple of these people i still know today um, but yeah, that's right. So when, and eventually we got, I got into just like selling a whole computer and it was kind of fun because you had to go to, we had the, the warehouse or the not retail, but not quite wholesale, not retail, but you get a slightly cheaper price if you knew them and you're on their list. So I would get all the components, build a computer for these people and then, uh, you know, deliver it to them on site. And eventually I ended up working out this was a terrible business to be in. These things are incredibly flaky. Leave it to Dell. But what I would yeah. then do is <laughs> when, uh, when I build a machine, I would take the machine into my campus office, my office at university, plug it in. And I think one time I was downloading lots, lots and lots. And the day later, the... Um, the administrator came around and said this internet this exact ethernet port has been used to download i don't know how many gigabytes upon gigabytes who was it there's eight of us in the room and i had to be like 
So yeah, I also that's why I thought you were going there with the story about plugging into campus uh, and just no. getting oh my god, it's T one, I can get everything. Yeah, All the CDs they did back in the day. They didn't care about. There was never a limit on like what you could take. It's just like it, back then because everybody. The first dorm room I lived in had eight, 18 stories tall. Okay, eighteen stories tall, and it had. I'm trying to think in my head. It had uh, it was like a, a corners are the rooms, and the center would be the bathroom slash elevator access slash uh, stairwell. So I want to say there was four rooms on each side with two people in each room. So four times four, that's sixteen rooms on a floor with thirty-two kids on each floor. Thirty-two times eighteen, that's how many. That's how many kids. Yeah. That's a lot. That's <laughs> a big like building. A, it's, I mean, that's a daggum lot. It's like 400, 500 students in this place. So there was, uh, they probably could have, but at the same time, they weren't, they were just like, go do whatever at the end. It was pretty, it was pretty new. Um, cool. But uh, I did have an instance where I got a uh, workplace cell phone. And this is one of the reasons why, if anybody who actually knows me, can't they can't text me like pictures or like a video or something or anything because i got these special locks on my phone that are, are irrelevant but, but anyway i got this I, back i i didn't have my own cell phone uh with my own cell phone contract till oh i mean it was pretty not not too recent but i want to say like 12 years ago before then i was given like a company phone. It's like, here's your job. Here's a company phone. The last job that I had with a company like that gave me a phone. And then, um, so I naturally the only, like my friends would be like, how do I get in touch with you? I was like, well, here's the phone number. And mm. one, uh, it was a Nextel plan. I remember the Nextel thing that was just before they got bit, bought by Sprint and, um, my company had it and they're like, here's your phone. And I was like, awesome. Thanks. Well, my buddy who was just being a goofball would start sending like images to everybody, you know, texting. Right. And I was just laughing. He'd be sending like, again, like dirty images and stuff and, and not think anything. And then one day I got called into the office and they were like, who who got seven hundred dollars worth of JPEG download images on their next account? And then they were like, you did. So they took the phone from me. They literally this is the took office the at your phone workplace. from me. Yeah. They took the phone from me and they said, you can only, they gave me a walkie talkie and they said, you can only use this now <laughs> while you're here. And, and it was all because, and it wasn't stuff. It was like, he would send it, to, just send it to me. And I didn't even it's think a about receiving it because fee back, as well, was yeah, it? Dot, yeah. Cause it was, again, it was, ne it was next tell. So they were like, they would always be like, uh, I didn't realize it, but they were running like next tell had this push to talk feature. Where it mm. basically turned all the phones on the network into t walkie talkies, so you could cool. talk to other people in the workplace, and it was mm. in a production facility. So like we could talk to each other by using this push to talk feature, without actually using minutes. So there weren't mm. a lot of minutes. There wasn't a lot of data. No data on this plan, and uh, so that was uh, that was funny. I got my phone taken away from me because of that, and then in I was the like, office. I had to go. Yes, the work, yes, professional workplace, not the university. You're I know. I was like, I was like, what? You need to take my phone from me. What happened? <laughs> oh, yeah, I did do that. I mean, it was somebody sending it to me, but I was just like, what? That's scary that it costs that much with this plan. <laughs> but yeah, that was uh, that was the only time where I had something like that happen, where some were downloading something caught back on up to me. I think also but, yeah. when we first got the internet in Australia, it was very expensive because you had to run a big motherfucking cable all the way. If you want to go anywhere, you want to connect Australia to anything, there's big cable. So we have we were used to expensive fees and slow internet and not having the latest and all that sort of stuff. We're used to caps. Everything had a cap uh, in Australia. Everything had a data cap and you would watch the gigabytes and stay under the gigabytes. And then there was... Uh, off peak and on peak and you could use a lot more gigabytes after I don't know 10 p.m. or something so we'd be staying up downloading all the new wares uh, after 10 p.m. where you have plenty of cap and then not touching it in the middle of the day I miss it but I don't yeah, miss fun. it 
<laughs> no, nobody misses that stuff. That stuff sucks imagine. when you have to track your internet, and then you get to the end of the month, and it's like, oh my gosh, I can't, like, nothing works, nothing's, like, six days of just internet purgatory. You're like, right. what have I done? <laughs> it's just, it's a mess. And then, uh, you know, having multiple people involved with the account, yeah, it's, it's, it becomes a nightmare. Thankfully, we don't have to deal with that as much, really, anymore. The data constrictions have kind of le- le- uh, let up on everything, mm-hmm. it seems like now. Like data and storage, all of it's getting so cheap and easy to use. It's and streamlined. It's really a good thing for a lot, like any of us. Yeah, and it's a nice place for us to, here in Estonia, where I live now. Uh, internet's pretty cheap, pretty regular, very fast. Yeah, you normal, guys had. No you guys caps. had. Uh, I learned from a recent video that you guys have had free Wi-Fi throughout the streets for six years, right, or longer. Uh, we have a lot of free Wi-Fi. They tend to you know how overplay I- <laughs> it in like everywhere you go. There's well, no, uh, but there's <laughs> it's pretty common everywhere you go. Like rest, if you're in some place, a restaurant, I don't know, a hall or something, you could expect some. Usually, there's going to be some free Wi-Fi there. And then to pay for Wi-Fi, there's a couple of uh, of big hotels in town like a Radisson Sass or something like that, and they still have a thing where they make you pay for the internet it's the only place in the country where you have to pay for the internet because <laughs> i mean it's radisson i guess they've got the same system in all yeah, their right. hotels around the world uh that's a weird but everywhere else well, it, it's uh pretty I, free here i learned it i learned it from a a, a pilot that's what it, that's where i heard it oh really you know? the pilot yes yeah, the, the pilot, estonian you know pilot, pilot of- <laughs> we're reflecting on i was in a promotional video for estonia oh, about video six so years awesome. ago uh, I should put the link to it here. I was a promotional I w- I video. I was laughing. I was like, I was talking to my wife. I was like, I wish you knew Lewis because this is just like the best thing I've seen in, in like a month is this video of him. But if I just show it to you, there's like no context. Like it just seems like a, f- a funny, good video. But yeah, um, no, just not, not to, not to, I was just joking there with you, but I did, I did learn That's that. Good. I remember learning that from that video where you said, oh, look, we've got Wi-Fi everywhere. Mm-hmm. But Free. we do have one of the things we do say in that uh, video is that it's extremely easy to file your income tax in Estonia. And that is true. Mm-hmm. I pretty much log in. Everything's pre-filled <laughs> for me. I'm like, yep, that looks about right. Submit and you're uh, done. That's the process. You don't want to know about filing your taxes wanna, in the United right. States. Oh my, oh, my gosh. It's like 80 billion pages of tax code here. It's just an unreal. There's nothing. That's a funny, you know, I don't know. I don't even want to talk about it. I don't even like to talk <laughs> about it. No, no. What do we got? Anyway, left? what do we got? Let's for forget the about that. Yeah, let's. Oh, let's 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 reflect here on one thing. It's been the end of the show. It's probably a good amount of people still watching. Right, <laughs> Wurgle. Let's reflect here on a minute. I wanted to go through some personal experience um, with uh, what Bob said recently mm. on the weekly podcast, or not podcast, the weekly news update, and it was a segment he did towards the end of the show where he was asking or talking, basically telling people that they are okay to send him um, ideas or write things for retro RGB. Because if you don't know, that's like why Bob's whole idea for retro RGB is to have a place that's not just, it's not Bob's retro RGB. It's a community place to go and have good posts, good information on anything relative to the community. So he was putting out basically a, you know, hey, it's okay to send me stuff and to apply even if you've never done this or you have any interest. Um, I wanted to just talk about how my experience went with that and yeah, how does. I went about doing it. But mm-hmm. this and this is again. So the the first I remember it being like it was like a giddy point in my life. I think it was like two years ago or something. Um, it was a July and Bob sent me an email saying, hey, man, I love what you did on this video. I'm going to write about it. And then it's just like at that point, you're like, yeah, yeah. Ooh, Bob, this is so awesome. I've, it's like I finally made it on like this is like it's like one of those hurdles. I feel like if you're like creating content in the retro space of retro gaming. And of course, like me, I've been following retro RGB since is, is since any time I've been like in this yeah. scene. And so, you know, the, just the actual idea of that it was just so awesome and then um and and then you sit there and you're like well i've got something else that might be worthy and 
you but you you know you understand bob's on the schedule where he's got a billion things going on and a billion mm. situations like that and there's just too much for one person to sit there and cover and so one day what was it it was so it was keith rainey he had just come up with this new monoscope pattern remember for the 240p test suite right. i want to say sure. it's like six months ago or eight months ago or something and I was like, Keith, this pattern is, you know, this pattern's awesome. And it's attached to Artemio, who I know. And I was like, this is great. Bob knows Artemio. You know, everybody respects the hell out of Artemio in the scene. I was like, I can get, you know, we we'll talk to Artemio. And then I was like, I can actually, I, I talked to Keith. I was like, I can call him. I called Keith on the phone, talked to him for an hour about everything he wanted to, uh, about this pattern. And it was all great. And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to sit down here and I opened up a Word document. I had some pictures from my video that I had worked on for the 240p test suite and this monoscope pattern and just wrote up some dialogue, basically almost like a press release. So it's like a press release, again, is what I would want to call this. Mm. I was like, I'm just going to do a press release format. And I remember sending, putting it in a PDF after I wrote it. And I said, I'm going to send this to Bob. And I sent it to Bob, and this is what I said. I said, Bob, I wrote up this um, press release, I'm calling it, um, announcing this pattern. It's from the 240p test suite. And he's like, great, I haven't written anything on it personally yet. And that would be extremely helpful. I said, well, here's the press release. You can write it. I said, I even give, I was like, if you want to, I don't care. I was like, you can take it and just like, you know, reference my video in it and I, you can have the whole credit on it if you want i don't care i literally just took the information that i had found from the research i did and mm -hmm. to give to him and he said he was it was so amazing because he was like no man look this is awesome here's a here's a login with wordpress i want you to write you know just copy this and paste it over there i'll help you out and you can be the writer here for retro RGB. And I was like, what? So it was, not, but, but my, my brain re and so then I got to write the article. It was awesome. You know, put it on there. And like, that was just an immense, you know, go from having something covered, then writing something and having it featured on there. It was, uh, to me, it was a great, uh, like one of the greatest moments for, um, early on retro tech stuff is, you know, community involvement. That was, I was like, yes, this is so awesome. This is something that actually people want and need. And there's a way for me to be involved. And, uh, so that all went really well. And, and the only reason I, I'm bringing this up is if there's anybody who's listening to this, it's any kind of creator, or even if you're not, and you like some of this stuff and you feel like it's, um, it's something that's worth covering. There's nothing like just do it. I feel like the way I did it was probably like, that's the right way to do it. And if you're thinking about like a professional, like you're in professional business too, like a press release kind of, that's how that works. Sure. Right. It's normal. Like if you have some information, you could put together an article or a press release and then you send it out to press out outlets and hope it gets covered. Hmm. So, um, I don't know. I, yeah. it does, I know it got a little long winded there, but I was like, if anybody has, it's, it's, and it's what Bob kind of opened up. He's like, if anybody has, even if it's something you're creating and you can write a little bit of an article about, um, the fact that he came out and now said it means that, uh, I think it's a great opportunity. If anybody's been thinking about it, I think now's your time to try it. It's a good time. It's a good in the way next couple in. months. Yeah. Um, I think any time you have a group like that. So, Bob, I've got some relevant experience here after building this comedy troupe in Estonia and dealing with a group of volunteers. When there's work, some people get paid, but often if you've done any stand-up comedy, you know there's usually not payment for years and you got to work for years until you actually earn some money. Um, and so working with volunteers, getting them in, and then after a while, we've got a group of comedians. We work together and people see us and they go like, ooh, that's, are you a niche? Are you a click? Are you uh, inward? Or oh, maybe I want to be part of that. Maybe I want to be that. And I've tried really hard over the years to strike this balance that I think there is, when you build a community, there's value in the community. Like the, there has to be some, if there's value in the community, um, not everyone 
can be in that community. Now, this is a little bit different to retro RGB. I don't mean to. I mean more like we've got a group of comedians and we have a very clear um, delineation, which is, well, you got to do stand-up comedy. In the end, we've got some mates of ours who are great, you know, hang out with and we don't mind. But if you want to hang out with us, no problems, but you got to do stand-up comedy and you got to show us that you're trying. But if you do, welcome 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 and the most basic not like oh we want to see a great act just like we could like as a comedian we can tell when you're trying we can tell when you're putting effort in and if you're you can be terrible but if we see that you're like a good person and you're trying and just experimenting and you're asking questions we're like welcome into the group and i think groups my experience here there's value in having a group because we work towards a common goal we're building that together, helping one another. So, but you, so yeah, you don't want to be too exclusive. That group can't be too hard to get into. We want it. So, and I, I can see Bob might go this way with not the general retro RGB community, but maybe more the writers. Like you need to put in the effort and, and, and write something. But if you do yeah. that effort, it doesn't have to be great. It doesn't have to be the most amazing thing. Bob's going to help you. He's going to work Absolutely. with you, be like, hey, actually, you know, for an article, you probably have a bit of this and a bit of that. And you're like, oh, got it. Right. I'm going to do it. So I think, and the, the, I'll take this one up personally. I know that whenever Bob says stuff like, hey, write to me, I'll help you. People kind of say like, oh, you're a gatekeeper. And I got accused here in the entertainment scene in my country of being a gatekeeper because I had a group of great artists around me. And if you're not, in our mindset, then you're not in our group. And they'd be like, well, aren't, isn't that gatekeeping? And it's quality control and wanting to be a good leader and set a certain goals for your group and leadership for your group. That's not gatekeeping because the implication is that no one can do anything else, which is untrue. Like, if, if I go to Bob and I'm like, Bob, I want to write an article. And Bob goes, no, for whatever reason. No, no, no. And then I go, ooh, 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 fucking Bob, fucking this. Well, <laughs> Bob's not stopping me from putting my article, video, tweet, whatever. He just happens to have a place where a lot of people look. You are absolutely welcome to build. If you think that it's not the correct way and there's a different philosophy that you would like to have beside your group, you are absolutely welcome. And I don't even mean that as a dickish way, like fuck off and do your own thing. No, if you don't, if, if, if that group and that philosophy isn't what you're down with, no problems, no bad feelings. Um, it's not a monopoly. People think that when one thing is dominant, that it's necessarily a monopoly. A monopoly implies that you are then actively stopping others entering. Yeah, that actively same preventing thing. anybody from coming up. Like, right, which is with, certainly and competing not. with you. No, no, nothing like that. I've never had that experience with Bob. And as someone who's also built a group, I can appreciate he's trying to help you. You know, if he yeah. gives you feedback and says, "Hey, this article needs a little bit more of this to be an article," right? Well, he knows he's written a whole bunch of freaking articles. Well, that's and that's and that's again. This is the idea, right, about this whole thing with retro RGB. It doesn't matter what you think. He's. Um, I look at it as a good thing. It's like he's yes. the editor in chief. And if I want to freelance, write an article, submit it to him. And just the fact that he would review it and give feedback. I'm going to tell you this. If you are a person who can write an article, it doesn't even have to be big or anything. You don't even have to be like a creator like us. You could just see some things mm. in something you follow and you're like, oh my goodness, no one else is seeing this. It's a great thing. I love it. And it's re in retro s space and you have no history with Bob whatsoever. If you do what I did, write the article, send it. I mean, Bob's got open channels on the internet. If you send it to him and say, hey, I again, especially right now, he will do, I guarantee you what I just said. He will look at it. Of course, he's going to help you edit it. Of course, he's going to have some ideas on streamlining it and making it better because he's got experience. And uh, so that's all the good thing. But as far as like the gatekeeping stuff, there is an element of that, but it's not a negative gatekeeping because 
we're talking about communities here. The you built the community in Estonia with the comedy stuff. You built it, or you your team built it. Same thing with Retro RGB. It was built by Bob and the team that he has put together. And of course, he can't just be like, "Oh, the gates are open, and every screwball in planet Earth is welcome to come in and just trash my house." It's like I just built this house. I want to have some respectful people over for a dinner party. I don't invite Bluto from Animal House to come over and chug Jack Daniels till he throws up on the carpet, right? Sure. So, Absolutely, and it's, it's not, not um, keeping a standard isn't gatekeeping. It's saying here's our community. These are the values that we have. This is how we want to show ourselves and how we want to represent ourselves. If you want to work with that, if you like that idea, if you like that philosophy then welcome. So again, back to that idea that the gatekeeping is not, there should be some in, um, criteria for entry, but it's, it can't be monumental. It's no, yeah, there, there's some, yeah, you've got to do the work. You've got to be a bit genuine. You got to try some stuff, but that's all you kind of need. And then once you go from that, um, so yeah, you do need someone there saying no and yes, and that's hard. That's that is the uh, that is what it is to be you know to lead a group of people that to to say yeah. that some people are going to get annoyed at you. I've had a whole bunch of people Absolutely. annoyed at me over the years, but I because then people thought that I was dominating the comedy scene here, and I'm like, no. First of all, you're really welcome to run your own show. You are absolutely welcome to do your own thing. We will not stop you. We're not going to fuck with you. You're really, really welcome. Um, and but the the leader will will get that, and the way that I, uh, as the the leader of that group over the years, was able to mm, comfort myself or draw strength, was that if someone was annoyed at me, I then looked around and first of all I analyzed: did I treat that person fairly? Have I given them a fair go? But secondly, then I would then look at my group. And look at the positive effect that the policies have had on the people who are doing well. I'm like, you know what? There's a whole bunch of guys over here who have done this and are really succeeding from it. And then they get it as well. At first, even my main comedians were like, Lewis, you got some, hmm, I don't know, you got some funny ideas about how this works. I'm like, go with me. Believe in this group. Believe that we can do it. And then after a while, the people will be like, oh, yeah, this kind of kind of works. Um, but all, you don't have to be a dick through all this stuff either. So I understand as the, the leader will always be the face and be the one who gets the, the first look, shots. Look, this is no, this is not a, I, I don't think this is a, is a big controversy versy as maybe some people do think so, because I've worked in businesses plenty of times and there's always a gatekeeper. There's always a gatekeeper. You're never going to get to go into a company, even if you work for the company, it's rarely, if it's a big company, the chances of you even going to having a meeting with the president of the company is a joke. There's a, he's got two or three gatekeepers that just sit there and keep his gate from you all day. <laughs> and again, it's, um, it's not, it's, it gets a bad reputation because again, you're just like hiding behind it. And sure, sometimes that is the case, but not in our communities. This is like mis misrepresented and misused because mm. again, if even if you you're unknown and you've never done anything, this is an opportunity for you to do something that is noteworthy to get basically published on one of the biggest communities in retro gaming. And again, you don't even have to be a creator that has makes anything you could except be a writer. There's nothing wrong with that. And then that might lead into whatever passion or corner you may have. But like you said, with the comedians you're like come on flow flow with me go with me try this out see where it leads and i can just tell you from my own personal experience it's led to a lot of good things i had a small channel um uh, i i haven't really been you know i never really like beat over the head the growth my channel has but it still grows consistently mm. and it's i mean i'm pushing fifteen thousand subscribers on youtube now and that is immensely helped by the fact that I have done what I can. And if I did more, it would probably be bigger than that as far as working within this community space. And oh. um, like I've written three, I think three times for retro RGB. And 
I, I every time I'm like, I should be writing more. I'm like, I should be writing something else. I know that there's like two or three things that I've got in my head for like two months about CRT stuff that no one's written on. And, um, I could just write it myself and put it on there and it would be fine. So the idea, um, I think it's a great, again, it's just an awesome opportunity. If you've ever had the idea, there's nothing wrong with doing it and submitting it. And again, if it's not, if it's something that, um, they don't get your feelings hurt. This is what, this is literally what the world is about is taking a risk on yourself. And this is, this is kind of a little risk. What's the worst that's going to happen is Bob will just say, Hey, look, I don't feel like this is the right article right now or something, or this isn't the right topic for this reason. And it will be a specific real reason. It's not going to be because he doesn't like what you've done. It's not like some schoolyard freaking middle school bull crap. It's not like that. It is a hundred percent. If you put in effort and it's visible on your writing, even if it's just like two paragraphs and it has value, mm -hmm. it will end up there. It, it will, if, if it's again, and, and there's plenty, I mean, I, I don't know what else, like there are so many projects going on that Bob can't cover, you know, and you know it, you know it, I know it. Sometimes we just think about it because like we get a little selfish, like we're thinking about our own projects and we're like, yeah, it would be awesome if this project got some, you know, hype on retro RGB. Um, but at the same time, yeah, you can't expect to go, hey, Bob, how you, what are you doing this week? Man, I got this awesome project. Why don't you write up an article on it yeah, and feature it on your show and do all this yourself? And it's like, no, that's not really the way it sure. works. But at the same time, it's not the way the world works. If a company comes out with a new product, they don't just expect uh, news outlets to hear about it and write articles. Again, they write, press release, send it out to the press outlets. It's not, yeah. it's not even, uh, it's not even an unusual, um, chain of chain of custody, chain of events. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I, and, and, um, I think the I, extension I just, of that, sorry. Oh, you popped me. Oh, no, 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 no. You're fine. Like, I, cause I'm getting a little long, long winded on some of these points, <laughs> but I feel like again, like you and I both know that, uh, Bob is a completely genuine, real person like there's um he doesn't put on like any persona he's like us yeah, which is really, really yeah. it's really like commendable to be able to put so much of yourself out there like him and um he will get so much flack from people just because they just like to give flack and he's big enough now to where they'll throw it at him and so um don't get again if you do submit something and it it you know if it needs more work, take the time, see what it is, you know, try to take some good criticism. It's mm -hmm. like, so and it may not be even criticism. I think what, what has Bob has kind of organically come across, um, is sort of a, 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 um, a rule of leadership, which is that if you want someone to grow, you need to give them responsibility. I need to give you responsibility. Now that when I give you responsibility to do a job or a task or write an article or make something, that also implies that you may not get it right that I give you the responsibility to make something. And it's not a guarantee you're going to get it right because you're new to it. But the only way you will grow is if you're like, oh, this is, I, I've got to do this. And I, I do think it's the job of the leader or the person who's making directions here to give you enough of a test environment. And I mean that in a general sense, not a computer test environment. Like that you have enough, you, I give you responsibility and I give you enough rope that you can not hang yourself. You'll get a little hurt. You'll probably scrape your elbows, but you're not going to fall over and have something bad. And the job of the leader is to produce an environment where people can, ha I'm going to scrape my elbow. I'm going to fall over once or twice, but that's nothing bad. That's all part of it. And that nothing terrible happens, but okay, I'm going to get a little scrape and I'm going to learn from that. I'm going to be like, oh yeah, because Bob let me do it myself. Or the leader let me do it myself, and it turns out it wasn't that great. But now I got it. Now I it's the only <laughs> way people learn. So I love, and and I, I guess oh yeah, where I was coming to this was, as that leader as well, you do need to be vocal about these things. We can live in our group, and think like yeah, of course everyone knows that you can just roll up and talk to Bob. But like you said, I had the same thing as well. You, when you see, I had to think about that when I was meeting Bob for the first time. Um, 
to to think like, oh my god, this guy, I've seen all the videos, <laughs> I know all the, I'm the Patreon, I'm everything. And then I had to reflect and think, well, when a new comedian comes to our group, they probably see Louis Ezra and go like, oh, he's the guy, he's the boss for the last 10 years. I'm a bit intimidated by them. And it's actually my job to break that down and to just chalk with them and be like, no, I'm not. It's not. Let me tell you how it works. Oh, you want to do that? Cool. You know, and that that's why Bob was very cool. So I could appreciate from the outside that I was like, maybe Bob's just a guy like me who wants to talk. So Right, of course. That's exactly what he is. And... Uh, to go back to your point of getting yourself hurt, Bob was the first thing he said. Um, you know, I wrote the first article, and naturally, it uh, it was not perfect. He's like, "Look, this is what you can do. Here's some things," and and it was all great. And then at the very first last thing, he's like, "All right, now listen. When I hit publish, um, there could be some creeps that come after you. They could see this, and they could think, oh, look, uh-huh. Bob's out here pushing retro tech, and he's, uh, you know, now now I'm I'm like." It's like it'll get the attention of, I guess, the people that, again, are negative towards the whole scene. He's like, it will get their attention towards you also. Mm-hmm. Um, and now and I'm I'm, at, I'm I'm very, very fortunate. My my I mean, it I have a, a, it like, again, the nutter thing. I have thick skin. So like criticism online doesn't really affect me like enough to make me go do anything. Sometimes I, I was laughing with you how I responded to some guy after drinking a bunch of beer <laughs> and like telling him to suck an egg. And then I was like, I posted it on Twitter and it got way too many likes where it was like <laughs> 200 likes. And I was like, what the heck, you know, unless I do like the coolest piece of CRT dirtiness, I get 200 likes, mm-hmm. you know? So, um, it's, uh, it's it, my, my, audience is very much 90 percent not not even negative and they're on on the topics so um that's but that's something that everybody who is any kind of personality on the internet is eventually going to deal with you got to think of it like a good thing once you see you know I, i always thought of it like this uh with video stuff i was like if i'm not getting any if i'm not getting one or two to four down votes of video then the videos the video is not good enough. I know that sounds crazy. No, it's good. But I if like it. That means that it's not reaching people uh, that for some reason dislike it. I was like, if if uh, it's if it's everything's perfect all the time, it gets you in this mindset that, well, how do I actually improve something if everything's a hundred percent liked? It's like what then if you change something, you're like, is that what caused it to go down or something? So it's. Um, you know, the majority of the people in this community, the vast majority of us, even though we're nerds and like you always say, of course, we can all be a bit autistic on things and get like obsessive compulsive about stuff and miss the joke, miss the context. That's not unusual for a nerd <laughs> to miss context on the Internet when someone posts a tweet joking about lag times on the CRT. Right. And then you end up with. <laughs> <laughs> with the world chiming in and you're like, oh, I was just joking. Right. So it's, um, it's always there. The criticism will always find you. But again, it's just, uh, it, that's just part of it. And, uh, I think, think of that, it as a um, rite of passage, I guess that, too. uh, tweet that you, you made. It's a really good example. Actually, that tweet that you made the other day. So someone wrote a snarky comment to you, you, you got him a good one back in the reply and you posted it, right? And I think there's, um, what I'm trying to do is balance off here venting and negativity. And I look, I think that's fine. Look, sometimes, you know, that's funny. It's good to sort of just put it out there. It was, what, what did you say? Suck an egg. Like, again, this oh, is Oh, yeah, not, no, you know, no. Well, I mean, just to give context, right? like on it, for example, and there's only the reason it really grinds my gears is when, Someone puts out like a response to a video and you can tell it's somebody who's just probably tried to do YouTube for a long time and never got anybody to watch their videos or they've been rubbed wrong because it's like a comment where it's like, this isn't 2016. Why are you going for a 10 minute video? And again, this is that's that was the weird. I was like, what? And then it's like the most obscure topic i'm like you found yourself on a repair video where i was showing how a few or a resistor acts like a fuse in less than 10 in 10 minutes right it happened to be 10 minutes 
It's like I don't I don't sit there and make content thinking about ten minutes. Look at more majority of my videos are well over ten minutes, and I can't like I'm like I've been trying to streamline stuff and get it cut down, and it still doesn't matter. So, uh, but yeah, it was like oh your script writing needs work, and uh, it's not 2016. You don't need ten minutes anymore, and uh, you shouldn't take that long to show how to use a multimeter, and all this nonsense. And I was laughing because I've I talked to you. I don't. I I have 340 videos. I have one video that I fully scripted out of 340. And then maybe I'll write a script for three minutes of a video where it's something that I just don't want to sit there and get on camera and say, yeah, well, this is how it goes. And, you know, and then repeat myself if I'm just talking mm. like here, we could repeat a, a line accidentally in a free flowing conversation. So, I mean, it was just all in all. And then, yeah, after just I think it's a good example and... because you, um, when you posted, you said it got loads of likes, right? One of the most liked tweets yeah. that you've had for a while. And it's a comment on that it is easy to succumb to the dark side, that the negativity, and there's a lot of people that they want to, they know that if they post something like, this person made a nasty comment about me, you know, and then you post it. Now, that's fine. Look, occasionally we all need a bit of help. We all want to be a re reassurance from our friends. We all just want to be a little sanity checked to know that that was a crazy <laughs> person and we're okay. And I think just a little bit occasionally is healthy. And But what you saw, because you could easily also, if you weren't quite you, you'd be like, I got 200 likes. If I do this again... I'll get another oh, 200 likes. Yeah, and then you start maybe, going down right. the path to the uh, being more Dr negative. Drama. Like all drama. of a sudden I'm a drama channel. <laughs> right. And, and it doesn't have to be like full drama, drama to be that. But you can... Yeah. A lot, I yeah. find a lot of creators, maybe in their own... Um, they're, they're struggling with their own self-esteem, as a lot of us do. And then they can get caught up on that. And then they do that, maybe call people out too much. And you're like, don't go down the trap. It's mostly good to stay above all of that but we're all human and sometimes it's good to just have a little well yeah and like it's that. at the same time right it's it's like this guy's comment it, w it was again you can go check on youtube too it's so funny you could check like if this person's ever left a comment before because a lot of times i'll get a comment where it's like something short and it's like maybe negative about a video and then i'll check it and i'm like this person's been subscribed to the channel this person's made 25 comments and this is i'm like okay well it's something about this video there's a topic that they don't like i don't care and then and i've never like i don't go in there and be like oh you're an idiot or anything it was just this was so cliche like all the things that youtube uh like the cliche thing you attack somebody that's like a youtuber on right yeah. the length of the video the script writing it's like so generic it's like and it's, some, it's like an ai bot just showed up to your channel and <laughs> just to criticize your, like i was joking um, with you because without without this, any actual good criticism in it this person is I'll apparently criticism. apparently they're an expert in youtube oh, yeah. in video production uh, yeah. and and not only that they're an expert in using a multimeter and they're <laughs> apparently an expert in how long it takes to educate someone on a bvm i'm like I can't imagine ever making that comment myself. Like, I don't what, know how long. But what, what kind of, like, at the same time, I was like, this is so ridiculous, because what else do you want? Do you want me to literally turn on the camera and say, hey, uh, this few, this resistor right here can act like a fuse. You better change it. If you have a problem, let's change it. Change it. It works. See you next time. It's like 60 seconds. Yeah. Sick. Oh, cool. I got the coolest. Then I'll just, you know what? Then I'll just, maybe I should do that. Maybe I'll just go over there and do TikTok videos on repairs and make them 20 <laughs> seconds. And then I'll be the, the richest guy. Cause I mean, it's not like I'm getting rich over here, making 10 minute videos on YouTube. I'm not <laughs> getting rich, obviously doing that, making 10 minute videos again. Golly. Um, it's just, uh, I, I try, I try to keep a happy balance. I know that there's mm -hmm. like, there's, there's a lot of people out there who, get even annoyed by the fact that I would give some like two minute intro. Um, I mean, I, it, it's so funny. Well, now we're getting, again, I mean, you now got, you're getting into a deeper topic about art. Right. Yeah. And I don't, and I don't want to get into all that. Cause this is like, this do, is, a, so, if we're yeah. an hour and a half into an this. I don't want to jump sure. into like another 45 minute conversation on like why I, why I do the, the structure I do on my videos right now. So <laughs> we got plenty more for the future. We got right. More. Yeah, we do. Uh, but yeah, but, I think um, that's a good, healthy conversation to have. Like, and and it's it's um, 
it's a humbling moment, all of it, but it will be, I'm telling you, if it's something you have any interest in, do it once, try it, because once you get it right and it happens and Bob says this great article and puts it up and you see it on the website, it's, um, it's going to give you every, you know, you won't get any money for it. Sure. But this isn't about money. It will give you that great feeling that we all do. And you'll be like, yes, what can I do next? What can I help out next? What can I write for next week? What can I write for the next month? Whatever it is. Um, I strongly, strongly feel that. I like it. Let's leave it there. That's a good sentence. That's a good one. To wrap up our podcast. Steve, thanks very much. It was a nice chat today. Thanks, Lewis. See you guys next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for in, uh, enjoying what we do and talking about it. I really do appreciate um, the positive comments. And look at any comments I know we talked about that. So thank you very much, guys. We'll see you next time.